Hi my loves, welcome back. How is everyone doing? <sighs> so I hope everybody had a good Christmas and a good new year. I know it's been challenging times. God, I feel like I'm saying that at the start of every video. But some good news on the horizon, obviously. Um, the time of filming, okay, it's the 9th of January for me today, but by the time this video goes out, we'll probably be the 10th, maybe even the 11th. And the 11th is the date of the big war crimes tribunal at The Hague. Israel is going to appear before The Hague for the crime of genocide. Big up South Africa, God. If you're from, I would be so proud to be a South African right now. If, much love to all the South Africans. I was listening to an interview with Breakthrough News. Just a quick plug for the podcast that I'm listening to the most at the moment. Breakthrough News, I really like a lot. Navarra Media, also I'm listening to a lot. Electronic Intifada is another good one. Democracy Now! Occasionally. I think I get put off by the word democracy because y'all know I'm an anarchist. I think we, we kind of idolize democracy like it's the highest way of societally relating, but I don't believe that it is. Um, but I do like the, that news out there. Um, democracy Now, um, Owen Jones, um, who else? Yeah, Empire Files, Abby, um, Abby Martin. But yeah, mainly a lot of Navarra media, a lot of Navarra media and um, who else? There's also a guy, there's like a military analyst guy. I can't remember his name though. Um, so yeah, check out those if you want like day-to-day -day stuff. Um, yeah, uh, so I was listening to a podcast with Navarra Media. Um, no, Breakthrough News, sorry. And they were interviewing somebody from the, one of the youth movements in South Africa. And he was just like, Nelson Mandela always said that our freedom as South Africans is incomplete without the freedom of Palestine. Um, and it's interesting because there's something about that year, 1948, that was the, create, the, the year that Israel was created, that was the year that the apartheid system in South Africa was created, that was also the year of the partition of India and Pakistan. Um, so obviously that's my personal connection to this whole geopolitical conversation. Um, but yeah, I'm also curious about what else happened in 1948 and if there's some deeper significance to that date, why so much happened that year. Um, but yeah, I'd also be interested to know what the solar activity was doing at that time because they have analysed that at times of very heightened solar activity, solar flares, solar winds, things like that, you will see major, major political upheavals. Like we're seeing at the moment, there's major, major solar activity. So even if you're not connected to what's happening on a macro level geopolitically, you might be experiencing a lot of changes in your internal world. For those of us that are following what's happening geopolitically, it's a whole storm like we're experiencing massive turbulence in our inner world and our outer world um so you know you may be experiencing you know challenges i know a lot of people i've been speaking to a lot of people in the dms who are experiencing a lot of upheavals in their personal lives in their relationship lives because of what's happening politically it's been changing people on a massive scale um, and if you're not following what's happening in Gaza, you are, and I'm not saying that people, like, I think people will be following it for their own reasons, like maybe they have an ancestral connection or a past life connection or they just have the capacity to bear witness, some people just don't have the capacity, some people are just apathetic and, you know, they're just business as usual, they have no connection to it, um, which you know, I know a lot of people who are following it feel extremely upset and disappointed and shocked by. Um, but let's also consider that there's also really terrible things. I don't like what about ism, but there, there are horrific things also happening in Congo and Sudan. And it is something that I reflect on a lot sometimes because I give a lot of attention to Palestine right now and I know I'm not giving the same amount of attention to Congo and Sudan. I'm not even... Um, super uh, researched on the intricacies of both of those issues 
Um, I know that Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, has a lot to do with our, the minerals that we use in our devices, which, you know, I found out about many years ago, and that's why I've always been very conscious about, you know, not buying brand new phones, always trying to buy them secondhand or keeping them for longer and things like that. Um, but it is something that I would like to research a little bit more into, but I also don't want to get super distracted because I know that activism can really, you're, you know, activism's hard. It's, you know, you have to have the capacity for it and you also have to have some boundaries around it and know what your limits are. Like, okay, how much time are you going to spend on it? What, wh where, because it's very easily to get, very easy to get emotionally activated by what you're seeing. And this is any form of activism. It could be women's rights stuff. It could be, you know, anti-racist stuff. And, you know, it can traumatize your nervous system and make you get pulled in to the point where you neglect other areas of your life and then those things can actually start to fall apart and then you're less you're actually less effective as an activist and also you can this is what happened to me the the last time that I was you know very involved in activism um, around 2016 2017 I started getting pulled in many different directions um, and that can also affect your effectiveness. Um, so, you know, if you start getting into, oh, I'm gonna advocate for this, I'm gonna advocate for that, loads of people would just constantly, because I was using my platform to speak up about a lot of different issues, um, it, this was around the time that I got very into intersectional veganism, and this is my issue with intersectional veganism, is, is that it, it analyzes all the different intersections of oppression, and I think that sometimes it can it can collapse in on itself because you do, we do, we do, literally don't have enough energy to focus on every issue ever happening everywhere. So you know I, I try and take a more balanced approach to you know people who aren't speaking up. You know if they're focusing on something else and they're just maintaining their focus on achieving that one thing really really well, then. They're doing the work that God sent them here to do. Like, I know it's difficult for us who are paying attention to be like, can y'all please help us say go for a ceasefire? We need everybody speaking up about this. We need everybody defunding. We need everybody boycotting. Da da da. Understand that not everybody has the capacity for that. Like, and, and you know, be mindful that you're not engaging in, you know, tyrannical behaviors. You know, we discussed this during the whole. COVID thing because a lot of the people who were the most like pro lockdown pro mandates were people that were very hard left activists intersectional intersectional feminists and stuff like that and they ended up that that energy can kind of turn in on itself and end up becoming very tyrannical to the point where you start you you turn into what you hate <laughs> you like you know um, extremes meet and and this is why I love Mark Passio's work so much because he talks about all of this from an occult level about how you know communism t uh, turns into fascism about the hermetic principles about the principle of polarity and about the middle path and this is why healing your trauma is so effective if you're involved in and and so important if you're involved in activism. I've definitely been relying on my Kriya Yoga tools that I teach in Reclaim Your Crown quite a lot during this time. That's why I also did some live healings, free healings, um, and some Kriyas on Instagram and a little bit on here as well to offer that. And the discount code that I shared in previous videos, I just have kept extending it because I want as many of you to have access to that course as possible at this time. So if you use the code TARIR30, um, at checkout you can get 30% off and if you're Palestinian either within the occupied territories or in exile contact me on Instagram send me a DM on Instagram and I will give you access to that course for free okay because I want as many people to have access to this tra these trauma healing tools as possible and y'all know you know your people have been going through the ringer and really deserve you know as much support as they can get from the international community and also just just on a deeper level what I was the point that I wanted to make that I'm going to come back to is if you're not paying attention to the situation in Gaza you are missing a massive opportunity for insane levels of spiritual evolution and growth 
everybody who has been paying attention to it has remarked on how much it's changed them. Just witnessing the grace and the resilience of a people who are being genocided and how they face that with such strength and resilience. I mean, w when you compare the insane levels of fascism that we're seeing coming out of the Zionist project, where they, they literally they, they will celebrate like killing babies and, and openly say that, you know, they all support Hamas, so we should kill all of them, and they want us all dead, so it's fine what we're doing. And there have been opinion polls that say that, like, 97% of Israelis are against a ceasefire and actually think that they sh the government should be using more firepower. Even though they, they are there are protests within Israel to take out the current administration, they're not happy with the administration, it's not... It doesn't seem to be because I want to believe that it's because they care about Palestinian lives and I know that there are some activists within Israel who do care about Palestinian lives but they do seem to be in a massive minority. I would love to be wrong about this, I would love to be wrong about this but it's not what I'm seeing and I'm doing a lot of extensive research on this every day. Even you know, the human rights activists from within Israel themselves um, have said that they're fearful of their own safety. Um, and they fear that they will be next because the the society has become so insanely fascist. Um, I shared a video on my on my Facebook yesterday, and you should check this out. Um, the, uh, it was by a human rights an Israeli human rights activist called Nurit Peled El Hanan. Apparently, she's related to uh, Miko Pelad, who's also another Israeli human rights. Um, activist pro-Palestinian anti-occupation and he's openly said I think actually his father was quite high up in the Israeli occupation forces but he's openly said that the Israeli occupation forces are the biggest terrorist uh, most well-funded terrorist organization in the world um, so you know I really have so much time for Israelis like this and you know they have my full support and solidarity because I know that they're doing a very dangerous job um, so I think Nured Pellet El Hanan, she is such a beautiful example of grace and compassion. Her daughter was killed by a Palestinian suicide bomber and she now speaks up for Palestine and anti the occupation. Like, this is what, and I'm not saying that, you know, I, she has every right to be angry and if she was against Palestinians, I wouldn't blame her. And I, I don't, I understand, you know, that they have, people within Israel do feel unsafe because of the occupation. But when you get to a certain level of awakening, you realize that the only solution is peace. Like, that's the solution. It's not killing more, wiping. When you have to exterminate an entire group to feel safe, then maybe you are the problem. Like, maybe you should look at that. Maybe your society, the society, the ethno-supremacist, apartheid society that you've created might be the problem and maybe that should be looked at maybe that should be changed um so yeah she's amazing so she uh this video palace i'll put a link in the description box below um this this interview she did 12 years ago palestine in israeli school books and she was basically looking at how you know obviously the israeli occupation forces um, can act with so much brutality against the Palestinians. Uh, most of these uh, soldiers are literally come right out of school. They're like 18, 19, 20, um, and they're already so brainwashed and so fascist. She was just like, how does that happen? So she analyzed the education system within Israel and looked at all the nuanced and subtle ways in which they brainwash people, in brainwash the children into dehumanizing Palestinians and seeing them as like, subhuman like this subhuman other just everything down to the language they use the way that they teach the history even the colors they're like the photographs where they show photographs of palestine and they'll make it look very like um they'll use like very muted colors to make it look kind of a bit savage a bit brown a bit vintage a bit primitive like deserty and then when they show pictures of israel they'll it'll be saturated with these bright colors and and make it look like prosperous and abundant it's a very very subtle ways of brainwashing but over time they you know produce a certain perspective 
and obviously I know this from growing up in the UK like you know the way that we were taught about the history of empire was just ridiculously racist and uh, you know Akala breaks this down really well you know I've, I've spoken about Akala in previous videos not for a while but he will break down the British education system and how it um, has brainwashed people into a colonial mindset so this isn't just an Israeli problem obviously a lot of people in the UK are very fascistic a lot of people in the US are very fascistic you know, we're seeing a lot of problems with fascism in India right now and and um, Hindu nationalism. I mean, this is, you know, this is a problem that exists everywhere. I mean, even within the Middle East, you know, like in the way that like in the UAE, they use like Pakistani and Indian slave labor to like build their high rise um, skyscrapers and stuff. So supremacy is not just a Jewish thing, obviously, it, in, in, their, in the religion there's the whole God's chosen people thing but I see that in a lot of religions so I've spoken about this before about how my ancestors converted from Hinduism because they thought the caste system was fucking bullshit they were Brahmin they were actually born into the highest caste and according to some erroneous beliefs and this is not actual Hinduism this is a distortion Hinduism is actually a very beautiful religion I would never have initiated into a yogic lineage and be studying Tantra if it didn't think so. But the, the people will distort stuff. Um, and so they've distorted and created this idea of this, you know, hi divine hierarchy. You know, even, even my friend Russell, who's a yogi, I was talking to him and he was like, oh, I had this friend who's like born, he, he's from India and he's born into a family of enlightened beings. So I'm like, that sounds, I was just like, that sounds familiar. I was like, what, can you elaborate on that? What, what, what is that? And he's like, oh, Brahman. I'm like, dude, that is so bullshit and so not true. You cannot be born into a family of enlightened beings. Like that, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. That's, that's literal ethnic supremacy. Um, so yeah, my ancestors, oh, my headband slipped off. So yeah, my ancestors were Brahmin and they converted to Christianity and on one side and on the other side they were born into the, the, the next caste which is the royalty and they also thought that was bullshit. They're like, there's something up with this religion that tells us that you're born into this group then you're supposed to be an untouchable. And, and the, you know, the, the abuse, the historical abuse of Dalits is absolutely disgusting like they it, you know they would have they would like pour molten lead into their ears and stuff like that and they, they're still very very oppressed you know Arundhati Roy has spoken about this um so you know one of my uh friends who um I won't say her name in case she wants to stay anonymous but we've spoken in the DMs she lives in India um is she's been talking about how a lot of the Hindu nationalism in India is getting scary and she's Hindu herself she says it's getting scary scary levels and you know they obviously show there's a lot of like Zionist support within India which is crazy to me because that that only goes one way like it doesn't go both ways <laughs> like I don't think Zionists would support Hinduism like <laughs> I, I really I don't I really don't think so like they would consider that to be idol worship um, so yeah that's that's interesting so just the whole idea of supremacy and fascism and interrogating the fascism within our own countries is a theme that I've noticed coming up for a lot of people you know while we've been looking at the alarming and very very shocking levels of fascism coming out of Israel to the point where it's like they're not even embarrassed by it and they're okay with all of us seeing this and being like what the fuck it's making a lot of us reflect on on you know how this plays out in other ways just colonialism and um and just the and oh, for me personally I've also been reflecting on the concept of indigeneity because I've been doing the research for the webinar that I've been preparing on the 12 tribes and that is turning out to be a much bigger training than I had originally anticipated when I announced it in, you know, the first video that I did on this subject. 
Um, I thought that, you know, I'd put some research together, make some notes, and then bust out a webinar within like two to three weeks. But it's such a contested subject um, with, that draws upon multiple different disciplines like archaeology, uh, linguistics, ethnography, um, you know, genetics, um, that I really wanted to do it justice. So it's taking a lot longer than I had originally anticipated. Um, and that's fine, you know, originally I was a bit frustrated and embarrassed that I'd kind of announced it too early and it wasn't going to be ready, but, you know, when it's ready, it will be worth the wait. And because it's turning out to be much longer than I had originally anticipated, a lot of the things that I wanted to talk about, kind of explaining more of the esoteric aspects of what's playing out with this holy war that's, that's happening right now, um, will probably end up being a series of trainings. Um, so yeah, just please bear with me, be patient, it will be worth the wait, trust me, it's super fascinating and it really helps to highlight, it's really for me making me reflect on indigeneity, what, is it, what does it mean to be indigenous, like what is indigeneity, is there like a statute of limitations on indigeneity, what does it mean to be in exile or to be part of a diaspora, does that change your, your indigeneity to a place? Um, and how, and if so, how, um, you know, yeah, like just the different bloodlines and the ancestry that we all share. And, you know, what it's really highlighted for me is actually how connected we are, like how really, really connected we are, because the 12 tribes of Israel, they've been, they, they literally scattered all over the world and they've been found in so many different places. So this whole concept of what does it mean to be, a Jew or what does it mean to be a Hebrew or an Israelite it's 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 not an ethnicity it's it's a certain blood it's certain bloodlines that then you know obviously emanate out into this tree I think a lot of it does tie back into the tree of life and obviously there's multiple other bloodlines as well um, you know the Ishmaelites the Shemites the the Hamites um, the Japheth Japhetites, uh, you know, however far back we want it, all going all the way back to the Younger Dryas or the Great Flood, um, and just looking at the evidence for that. Um, and yeah, just looking at our shared history, it's so, so interesting. Um, and, you know, we've probably all mixed in with these bloodlines at some point because people mate with each other. And so at what point can you say that you're this people or you're that people or what lineage you come from? And yeah, it's just fascinating. Like I really, I can't wait to, I'm literally busting to share it with people. I've actually been like sharing little dribs and drabs of people here and there because I just can't keep it in. I, I shared one piece of information because I have, there's somebody on my friend list who's a, I would say a liberal Zionist. And he's been sharing some posts, some of which are fine, some of which are a little contentious. And, and you know, a lot of people were getting into debates with him um, about, you know, the situation he has. Uh, I didn't unfriend him because, I don't know, I'm always curious to see what people are saying. And, you know, he wasn't outright supporting genocide, but he, he is a, a liberal Zionist. Um, and yeah, he was sharing some posts about, you know, the bloodlines and, you know, the tribe, tribe of Judah and the, the, the tribe of Levi and asking people about their perceptions and opinions about Jewish people. And it was, it was interesting. Um, he shared a particular hadith, um, which is like an end time prophecy. I'm not going to say which one it is. It's quite contentious and some people have claimed that it's very anti-Semitic. Um, which is an inaccurate term because Arabs are also Semitic. Um, Muhammad, uh, the prophet, um, was also a Semite. Um, but yeah, it, it does predict an end time prophecy in which there will be a holy war between Jews and Muslims and Christians and all the different types of people. So he shared this particular hadith and he was just like, see, the Muslims hate the Jews. And so I just had to share this one tidbit that I had found, which literally blew my mind. I'm not gonna share it here because it's just too juicy and I wanna save it for the webinar, but I shared it with him. And I was just like, you would be surprised 
who is actually a Hebrew. Um, and I didn't, I'm not, uh, I'm trying not to reveal too much, but it's so good. Anyway, I shared the information with him and I actually share some ancestry with this particular bloodline. And, um, and he was fascinated. He was absolutely fascinated. And uh, he actually messaged me and he goes, so I actually commend you for approaching this subject with such open-mindedness. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been interesting. Like I actually, look, I do, I do understand the Zionist perspective, not the killing of innocent people or the this land is only ours, but I do understand wh why they want a homeland, why they want to return back to this ancient land, um, why they want to bring all the people that they consider part of their family together. I get that, like there's something quite beautiful about it. Um, and I, I, I would say the person who speaks about this with the m most balance and grace is Gabo Mate. Um, uh, he, how he explains, and I think some of the, um, the some of the most eloquent um, allies of the pro-Palestinian movement are former Zionist Jews, like Gabo Mate, like I can't remember his name, but he's an Iraqi Jew. And he only recently, like in 2006 or 2007, started to undo some of his Zionist programming. And he's written books about his experience as an Arab Jew and his experience in Iraq. And he did a lot of research into the history of, you know, the migration of a lot of the Jewish communities from Iraq to Israel. Um, so I will, I will look, uh, I'll try and find it in it, some of his work and put it in the, in the description box. Because if, I think if we want to see peace in this area, it does involve people coming together, people who have historically been taught to hate each other um, and who have perpetrated violence against each other. Obviously, with the situation it's in, in occupied Palestine, it's pretty one-sided. Um, but there, there will need to be people on both sides coming together in order to facilitate the peace process. Um, just like what happened in South Africa, it's going to be necessary. It's going to be. I'm not going to say. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Um, and I will not like. I will not ever presume to speak for Palestinians. Obviously, Palestinians should be front and center of that mo movement. But I think that anti-Zionist Jews, uh, former Zionist Jews who've unlearned their Zionist programming, need to lead the charge with, you know, helping other. Zionist Jews to unlearn their supremacy and their Zionist programming if we ever want to see peace in that region but yeah a lot of this a lot of this does come down to the elites tr basically trying to bring everybody into like this messianic um, war where they intend to bring in the Antichrist and build the third temple in Jerusalem and create a one world government um, and have everybody united under one religion and it will be ruled under the Noahide laws which is fine if you're Jewish it's probably also fine if you're Muslim there are some Imams that have been also you know meeting with the rabbis and having these kind of discussions about how to move forward if you're Christian though, it's kind of bad news. Like I do feel, feel like Christians, pantheists, pagans, Buddhists, um, Hindus should definitely be concerned about a one world, one world religion that where <laughs> everybody's ruled under the Noahide laws, okay? Because I'm not saying that this is gonna happen. I'm just saying that there are people who are trying to make this happen. Um, but God always has other plans, okay? And when I talk about God, I have like a personal relationship with God that exists outside of any text. I do refer to certain texts to find out what I think is the truth, but I just don't believe necessarily that any of these texts are the 100% word of God. I believe that they were translated by humans and humans are imperfect. And I don't think that humans can perfectly translate the word of God. And most of these Abrahamic texts as well have been translated, a lot of them have been translated from 
have been translated multiple times, so the, the original meaning is actually lost. So Paul Anthony Wallace, who um, has a YouTube channel called The Fifth Kind, I highly recommend you look at his stuff, okay? He's an esoteric researcher. I think he used to be a Christian pastor, might even still identify as a Christian pastor. He's done excellent work on decoding um, some of these original texts. And according to him, a, a lot of the original texts that were original passages that were attributed to God were not actually God, but were a series of different Elohim. So Yahuwah or Yehovah, Yehovah, Yahweh was one Elohim. There was Asherah, El Shaddai, possibly others whose names I'm not familiar with. He's the expert on that, so please go follow him and check out his channel and check out his work. Um, He's basically broken down that a lot of these are not the word of God, They're, these are the words of various Elohim, and some of them might have even been fallen Elohim. Um, or they could have just been people channeling what they thought was the word of God, but could have just been something made up, or could have been even from a demon. So, you know, the, the, when, if you read, you know, any of the n later translations, like King James or New International Version of the Bible, They'll be like, and God said, and God said, and God said. And they've literally obfuscated who actually said those things. Because some of those things were not said by the Most High. They were said by various Elohim, some of which could have been fallen angels or literally archdemons or archons. This is why I tell people to also read the Nag Hammadi text. Okay, now obviously those have also been translated, so there's probably some obfuscation going on there as well, but just treat everything with just a little bit of skepticism. Like, God would never tell you to go and decimate people. He would never tell you to go and exterminate that particular bloodline. He would never tell you to go and kill the women, the children, the oxen. Um, I just don't believe that God would do that. Like, this shouldn't be controversial to say. Um, but yeah, apparently, apparently it is. <laughs> apparently, that's 2024. That's where we are as a collective. It's controversial to say, hey, God, God wouldn't wouldn't condone genocide. Um, but yeah, that's where we are today. It's kind of a bit depressing. But I do feel like a lot of people are waking up, and you know, a lot of us could see it in like 2020. We could see that governments everywhere are tyrannical, and that we've clearly being run by some kind of shadowy deep state shadow government, a cabal, like an evil cabal um, that's running things and wants to exterminate most of humanity, which is why they're running, keeping everybody locked in their houses and forcibly poisoning us with experimental toxins. Um, now, what I notice is that a lot of people who are pro all of that are the people that are now noticing that we're having the most widely publicized genocide in history, widely broadcast, and nobody's doing anything. The, the powers that be are not acting to stop it. And this is waking a lot of people up. I mean, it is, obviously. It's waking a lot of people up. Um, and alongside that, we're also having the Jeffrey Epstein papers being disclosed. And now Jeffrey Epstein has a very interesting connection to the Israeli intelligence services. So people are starting to wonder, like, what's going on there? Like, what is Israel? Um, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I know the answers to this, okay? I believe that it's a colo US colonial outpost. It's a military base in the Middle East, funded by the deep state to divide and conquer the Islamic world, okay? So it's basically like a colonial outpost. Now, I do believe that Saudi is also the same thing. I believe that the Saudi royal family are part of the deep state as well. They're part of the cabal, which is why they're not doing anything to help the Palestinians. People are like, oh, why are the Saudis? Why, you know, UAE? Why are so many of the countries not acting? Um, to help the Palestinians. I think some of them are in on it. I, w I won't say all of them. I don't think Yemen is in on it. I don't think... I don't think... Um, I mean, it's interesting because I've, I've heard some conflicting opinions about this. 
um, about the leader of Hezbollah being in on it, but I don't think that he is. I don't think that he is. Maybe he is, and it's just a very sophisticated ruse to get everybody into this holy messianic war. Could be, could be. Like, I don't know. I'm not going to pretend to have the answers, okay? The more research I do, the more I realize how much I don't know because there's so many different conflicting opinions and things that you can look at. Um, and also, I, you know, I'm not one of these people who, you know, don't get me wrong, I do identify as a conspiracy theorist, but I'm not one of these people who thinks that everything is being controlled by a group of shadowy figures at the top. I'm not saying that there isn't a group of shadowy figures at the top trying to control everyone. I absolutely do believe that there is. And not just believe, I know that there is because I've done enough research into secret societies like the Bohemian Grove, the Order of Skull and Bones, um, the Trilateral Commission, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Groups, all these alphabet societies and all these secret handshake clubs, the Freemasons, the Illuminati and all of this lot. I know that there's a shadow group of people who work for their own interests, but I just don't believe that they have as much control as some conspiracy theorists like to believe. But, and I, I, this is a very disempowering belief to have. Like, do you really believe that those that do not serve the Most High or have this Luciferian or just outright satanic mindset that they are God? Um, do you do you really believe that they are more powerful than the Most High? And I know some people are going to find that controversial. What I just said because I know a lot of you know like light workers or like uh, awake people who believe that they are God. I don't believe that we are God. I believe that we are emanations. We emanate from the Godhead uh, along with our soul stream and our multi-dimensional self, our 12D avatar, and we can choose to merge with it um, and do God's work on this planet. Or we can choose not to, we can choose to separate ourselves from it and end up becoming demonic and we end up becoming taken over by dark forces and becoming dark portals. And I mean, I don't just believe this, I've seen it in the field, okay? I see where people, and this is not to make disparaging comments about people um, or anything like that, but when you break your connection with God, you do end up becoming lost. You end up just <laughs> floating in the ethers without any kind of guiding compass. And it's a very sad experience. It's very, very sad, and I know because I've been there, and it tends to make people depressed, it tends to make people more likely to become addicted to self-destructive behaviours and like I said, become end up becoming dark portals for dark spirits. Um, obviously we can heal and correct this by turning back to God through prayer, through giving our lives back to the Most High, through ascension technologies as well, which do it very quickly, like what I teach in Reclaim Your Crown. Hi, Lily. <laughs> um, and quantum field work, you know, the quantum field work that I do with my clients bring realigns them back with, you know, their highest self, uh, their 12D avatar, and connects them to their soul stream, their parallel avatars, you know, who they are in other lifetimes. I don't like to use the term past life because they're not past, because all time is now. They're your parallel incarnations that you're living out. And they can cause issues. Like if you're having an issue, so let's say you have a lifetime in ancient Sumeria where you're a priestess. You know, I talk about this a lot because this is what, I have multiple avatars in ancient Sumeria running these particular like and ancient Egypt as well and a lot of the women who find my work do as well so this is something that comes up often in readings let's say you have a previous lifetime in okay let's go for something less obvious you have a previous lifetime somewhere in ancient Europe and you were a priestess in a goddess worshipping lineage 
culture, shamanic, you know, following some kind, you were basically like a high priestess within some uh, order and something within that culture got a little distorted somehow. Could have been some war timelines, some survival programs that were running that caused you or maybe other people that you knew in this particular lifetime to misuse their power, that can end up creating issues not just in that lifetime but can bleed through into other lifetimes. And this is one of the things that we'll do in my quantum fieldwork sessions. We'll go and see where the issue is coming from and the field will just reveal where, where that issue is and sometimes it's just childhood stuff you know from your own childhood in this lifetime usually we'll correct that first but for some people we, it can go a little bit deeper like we'll go into those par our other parallel or past lives first before we go into their childhood because sometimes going into our own childhood can be extremely vulnerable but healing trauma from previous lifetimes or parallel lifetimes can almost feel safer because it's like even though it's still you it's you in another lifetime so you know it, it feel it can sometimes feel a little safer to reclaim those um soul splinters so it's like a soul re reclamation that we do yeah the thing it's just it's it's so it's so so heartbreaking um to wit to witness what's happening in gaza right now um, this is literally, I mean, from, from what I can see and not just from what I can see, but also what I've researched, these are, and it's not, it's not the only bloodline that, that we're seeing in that part of the world, but we are seeing the extermination of the descendants of the Essenes, um, like you know, this is what, you know, they, they can, they cancelled Christmas in Bethlehem, you know, the birthplace of Yeshua, Isa, uh, which is in occupied Palestine, um, because Christian Palestinians are being exterminated. It's not, Palestinians aren't only Muslim, but even if they are Muslim, firstly, we're seeing this, you know, these are some of the oldest Christian communities in the world. They are the original followers of Yeshua and Mary Magdalene and the original disciples of Christ, the Essenes, um, and these are their descendants, but many of them did convert to Islam, okay? And they weren't all, people love to have this narrative that they were forcibly converted to Islam. Do you know that Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world? In fact, I think it even is the fastest growing religion in the world. And the number of people that I have seen take Shahada after watching what's happening to the Palestinians because they're so inspired by the grace and resilience that they're seeing um, that people can literally face extermination, have, be picking up pieces of their children in bags and still be praying to God and still have such unwavering, unshakable faith um, I think for me, one of the most um, memorable scenes was seeing a man in a hospital and he was reassuring, like the other people in the hospital were crying because I think their friend or their brother or uncle or some, somebody in their family um, had uh, been martyred. And again, I'll talk about the concept of martyrdom as well. Um, and he was just like, come on, he's gone straight to heaven. Like he's with God now and you know if you've studied you know the occult if you've studied the different dimensions if you've read hermetic philosophy yogic philosophy read autobiography of yogi they explain this really well that after you move from these layers of density you'll pop out in areas which are slightly less dense like a dream world almost the astrals basically which will be like the fourth the fourth to like the seventh dimension. They can feel, if you've ever had a dream that feels really real, or if you've popped out of your body or had sleep paralysis and walked around your room, happens to me quite a lot. Um, 
you'll know that the astrals have a physical quality. You can actually touch things and you can also get hurt. Like I've hurt myself in the astrals before. I've felt things. I've been astrally raped by demons multiple times. Um, astral torture is a thing that you know many of the oracles that I've trained with or clients that I've had have experienced um, and that, that I help people with. Um, so the astrals can definitely be dangerous as well, just like this plane, but that it's more pliable, it's less dense than this reality. You could things manifest faster, um, things manifest at like miraculous lightning speed sometimes. So you can fly, um, all kinds of cool stuff that you don't that we don't experience here in this reality. And then basically an autobiography of a yogi explains this really well, that you're basically recycle through the astral, between the astrals and, and this reality, this is known as the wheel of samsara, right? You keep reincarnating because you're, you're addicted to this physical reality, because it is quite addictive, it's quite sensual, there's like, you know, pleasures of the body, pleasures of food, pleasures of a sunset. So people, and, and until they get to a certain point of awakening or enlightenment where they don't feel the need to be tied to this place because there is so much suffering here as well but it's addictive so then you'll start to awaken within the astrals and then you'll have this then once you awaken in the astrals once you die in the astrals and there's also another film that you can watch it's a mexican cartoon about i can't remember the name of it we watched it during dia de los muertos um yeah, just I struggle with that pronunciation a little bit. Um, yeah, I'll put the link to the film in the description box because I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but they also explain this quite well as well. Um, and the way that they depict the astrals with like so much beautiful bright color is also how I've experienced it. It's very, it's very colorful. Um, it's also what you'll experience if you take like magic mushrooms or like you know other types of entheogens you can start to see into those dimensions it's much more um, fractally and more colorful than this reality but once you pass from the astrals you pass over you die basically then you go into the causals and then you might still loop because you're addicted to the lifetime that you experienced in the in the astrals so your first lifetime that you experience in the astrals or the causals you'll be kind of sleepy and you won't really be super awake inside of it until you recycle this is, this is sorry guys i really should have ordered a new battery for my camera um yeah this is the thing we've already been here so many times before which is just crazy and mysterious and beautiful um and also kind of a little disturbing because <laughs> like, some of us want to leave. Um, but yeah, what this man was saying to the others in the hospital was just like, don't worry, like he's gone straight to heaven. Like, you know, the sacrifice that he's made, he's di directly with God now. He can just bypass all of that. And I was like, wow, like for somebody to to be able to maintain that level of composure and faith and and resilience in the face of so much unbearable grief and trauma that's so inspiring um and then the camera followed him and interviewed him and asked him if anyone in his family had been martyred and he was just like yeah um he he's, he was he said both his son two son he lost two sons and he actually used a word, I can't remember the word that he used, but it was like, um, like praise be to God or something. And this is the thing like that people, like racist people like Ben Shapiro just do not get. But I feel like since my awakening and definitely since COVID, I understand where he's like, oh, these people aren't like you and I, like such a, such a motherfucker. Um, excuse my language, but like I really don't like Ben Shapiro. Um, he was like, these people aren't like you and I. They're like in a death cult. Like they sacrifice their children because they worship death. We worship life. 
And it is true that in Islam, there's more emphasis put on the afterlife and that this life is just a test, a moral test, in fact. Um, and in Judaism, there's very little mentioned of the afterlife. It's more about this life and making this life as good as possible. And I'm not saying that one is wrong or right. I can understand the perspectives behind both of those types of thinking. But I definitely resonate more with the Islamic, Islamic perspective. I find the Judaic perspective to be a little bit false light and I can see how there could be moral issues with it. Um, which is why I consider um, Islam to be a more evolved religion because it came later. Do you know what I mean? Like, it makes sense that you would have a religion, people would misunderstand the teachings of those particular prophets and no disrespect to you know, the, the prophets of Judaism because they're the same prophets in Christianity and Islam as well. But I do believe that people misinterpreted that. And so that's why more prophets were needed to be sent, like Yeshua, like Muhammad. And uh, it's making a lot of people very Islamic curious. It's, I mean, I've been, it, even before this, I started becoming quite Islamic. I mean, I'm from an Islamic background anyway, but I've never been particularly religious. I actually stopped believing in God. I've spoken about this in previous videos. I stopped believing in God um, in my teens. Um, and then I had a spontaneous Kundalini awakening. So then I was like, what is going on? And then I started researching metaphysics, quantum physics, um, Greg Braden's work. Um, I started looking at yogic texts because obviously they explain Kundalini. Um, and yeah, now I'm like coming full circle. So it was actually after Sinead O'Connor parts very sadly passed away. Um, uh, you know, I put, I, I reshared some, you know, pe people were posting about her and I was just like, yeah, Sinead O'Connor has always been an OG. Like I have so much respect for her. I really, really respected the way she stood up on that stage and called out the Catholic church for their suppression of their paedophilia problem and just really always stood up for justice and for truth and she was vilified for it and i really like anybody who's like spoken truth to power or said things that aren't popular and have faced backlash for that will resonate with that and that's why a lot of pe so many people are basically developing a relationship with yeshua in the in recent years um, because he was all about that. Like he was literally crucified for speaking the truth because he was such a threat to the powers that be. Um, so hearing that she reverted to Islam in her later life, I watched an interview with her on the Dean show and something that she said really hit me when she was like, oh, I, I started listening to the Quran and she goes, I realized I'd always been a Muslim. Like it wasn't like I became a Muslim, I realized I already was and always had been. Um, that got me really curious. I mean, obviously I still have reservations about organized religion, but you know, I think it's, I think it's time that we all started looking into these texts and, and really looking at what they're saying, because especially with what's going down right now in the world stage, whether these texts are true or not, the people who are running things certainly believe in them. And I believe that they might be misinterpreting them, but because otherwise, why would they be doing such crazy evil shit? Um, so I think really arming yourself with the knowledge is gonna be very, very important going forward. So I'm trying to do that as much as possible. Obviously, I'm only one person. Um, so I definitely do um, revert to other experts on the subject who spent many, many more years researching certain things than I have. Um, so, so yeah, um, I think that's it. I think that's all I want to say today, but yeah, I, I, I'll try not to wait three weeks before jumping on again and, um, coming on to talk to you guys. Oh yeah, no, there was one thing that I did want to talk about. So I came across a resource recently. It's a YouTube channel. If you, if you guys want to take things a little bit further, if you've already been to protests, if you've already donated money, not that you have to necessarily do, I think everybody should know what their limits are. I haven't been to any protests because where I live, there aren't protests and to fly 
to another place to participate in protests I thought would be not the best use of my energy. I thought I could maybe just donate the money that I would spend on flying to you know, giving humanitarian aid to people on the ground. So you've got to look at what your capacity is and what your boundaries are around what you're willing to donate, what, what risks you're willing to take. Are you willing to get arrested? Are you able to get arrested? Not everybody is able to get arrested. Like I would have no problem getting participating in a direct action in the UK because if I get arrested in the UK, I'm comfortable with the legal system and my rights as a sovereign being under common law that I believe that not only would nothing happen to me, but I could probably even sue the police and get paid. So I would have no problem doing that. I've done it once before. And if you guys want me to make a video about that, about how I got arrested by the police at a protest and then sued them and got paid, I will do that video because I think that that could be really useful for people. Um, but yeah, the, if you want to take things to another level and actually look into tax striking and defunding governments who are participating in war crimes and genocide, that's another measure that people should definitely look into. It's a little bit, takes a little bit more research, okay? I've been doing this for many years. I, look, I started looking into it in like 2007 when there was a war in Iraq. So I've been practicing this for many years. It's very easy if you're self-employed. Um, and it's very easy to do perfectly legally as well. But it's, tax striking is not only lawful, it's actually a legal and lawful obligation under international law that we defund governments who are actively participating in a wars of aggression. However, if you are living in one of those countries under one of those governments, they don't care, they clearly don't care about international law. So there are still risks to, to, to doing that. So I found a resource, it's a US based resource. I'm still gonna post it. I'm still working on trying to find a UK based resource. Um, and if other people know of other resources in other countries that they want to send me that I can share with everybody, it will basically, talks through all the different options for withholding tax in the US based on your your circumstances whether you're self-employed or whether you have a business or whether you um, are under salaried employment and also the level of risk that you're willing to take and they explain the risks as well and the risk factors the risk factors seem to be pretty low like even though there are certain things that they will talk through about you know war tax resistance um, for you know people who are conscientious objectors to you know war crimes imperialistic wars um, there are some risks, but they do seem to be quite low. Like the, some of the, the actions that they take are officially illegal, not unlawful. There's a difference between legal and lawful, okay? Legal is contract law, lawful is common law. Um, I don't wanna to get too deep into this stuff, but those of you who've researched kind of common law, natural law, universal law, you know, all the free man stuff will know what I'm talking about, you know, maritime law versus the law of the land. Um, but I don't, I don't want to get too deep into that because I don't want to confuse people. Um, but the risks are quite low. So check out that YouTube channel. It's, it will like it literally each video is like 20 minutes long and it gives you so much information, talks you through step by step how to do each thing. Um, there's other, I will also post other resources lower down. There's a web, there's a YouTube channel called Man and Law. Um, and Sean Stone as well, who basically will teach you how to, the, the, the free man movement has evolved quite a lot since I first started researching it about 10 years ago. There's, you know, a lot of it was about how to withdraw from the system and, uh, you know, how to basically, you know, sign your affidavit, declare yourself a free sovereign individual, you know, a man or a woman, living man or woman on the living soil and extract yourself from the beast system, which doesn't really serve people. Uh, but you know, there's a guy, I can't remember the, his name, but I'll, I'll post his YouTube um, channel where he talks about how to actually create your own straw man and use it as a corporate entity to do business with. So you then basically enter into contractual agreements with the system so you can benefit from the system. And it's a whole new revolutionary way of doing the whole free man thing. And I think that it's going to be very useful for, you know, truth seekers and, and you know, um, 
those of us who are trying to become more sovereign going forward and, and to conduct ourselves in a more integral way. Okay, guys, so that's it. That's all I have to say for today. I will try and jump on again next week or, you know, within the next two weeks, hopefully. Um, if you want to book a session with me, then you can DM me on Instagram and book your session in like that. And I would love to assist you and I'll love you and leave you guys. Peace out. See you in the next video. One love.